och Anna Fronsäck från Krakow. Båda är medieforskare med genusprofil, kan man säga. De ska vara hos oss i några dagar och prata idag om man kan säga, homorörelsens bidrag till att vara en motkultur till det nationella konservativa Mm, eh, antifeministisk kan man säga kultur som råder i Polen och har gjort de senaste decennierna eller lång tid tillbaka. Eh, det kommer eh, Ursula att exemplifiera med några filmer från, eh, eh, från 80-talet. Den första eh, lesbiska filmen med mainstream-profil som har gjorts i Östeuropa på 80-talet. Eh, Imorgon för övrigt blir föreläsningen får den en tydligare politisk nutida karaktär i mediehuset. Klockan 9.30 till 11 håller vi på där. Då blir det mera dagsaktuella frågor som rör yttrandefriheten, yttrandefrihetens tillstånd i Polen och hur man bemöter det sortens, den sortens liksom repressiva repressiva uttryck som, som alternativa sexuella eller alternativa familjebildningar, sexuella minoriteter möter i dagens Polen. Inte minst med hjälp av populära medier. Men varsågod Anna och Ursula. It's on. Thank you very much, Henrik, for, for, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and thank you very much for uh, coming uh, here today for, to uh, listen to us. Um, uh, what we want to today, uh, today, what we wanted to say is to introduce our a part of our research that's going on for, for years, for over the de decades, uh, uh, independently, but somehow uh, our research meets together, so we decided that it's a good idea to uh, deliver lectures together. Uh, but I want, first of all, I wanted to thank, uh, uh, thank the Dalarna University for uh, hosting us for uh, wonderful cooperation and uh, 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 hospitality. Thank you, Henrik, and thank you, Susan, for, for making it possible. Um, as you can see from the, from the title of the presentation, what we wanted to, to do today is to talk a little bit about lesbian visibility and, uh, uh, in uh, contemporary Poland, but uh, in order to do that, we go to the historical overview of we will just look into the first mainstream, lesbian mainstream film, and I will be uh, uh, introducing this first uh, mainstream film that went through the big uh, cinema theater in Poland, and I will talk a little bit about this. And um, surprisingly, it's not a Polish film, it's a film uh, made by Hungarian uh, director Karoli Mak. I will all explain this a little bit complicated uh, connections. We will uh, go into intertwinement between the lesbian history and national discourse, and uh, and a little bit think. Uh, you know, we we'll try to finish with connect, with the conclusion of what the lesson from uh, from the rewriting the history or writing as her, her stories. Uh, rewrite, rewriting the history of, uh, uh, um, from the perspective of uh, uh, non-heteronormative, uh, normative, uh, uh, non-heteronormative history. Well, what I would like to uh, talk first is actually to tell you a little bit about this um, film. Just go. I'll try, I hope it. I will make it so that. It's another way, Egis Masrat Nezve, a film by Karoli Mak. Well, it is Hungarian um, film from 1982. The name is Another Way, the title is Another Way. It is considerably different title from the Hungarian title because Hungarian title goes for each other. And the film is based on the novel, uh, the novel from 1980, by Elisabeth uh, Galgozzi, and the title of the novel is uh, Within the Law. 
the Polish title was the Polish title, the Polish translation of this film was uh, uh, another glance, another look or gaze in the spojrzenie. And the first English translation of the book that the film was based on uh, was translated as another love in na miłość. And the Polish translation, the very short translation was also another love. And when you think already at this very vocabulary, which I start from, another love, within the law, it indicates the basic scope of problem determined by the main theme. Transgression of heteronormative algorithm of desire, life project, relationship, social accept acceptability. Here, linguistically represented by gaze, eye, looking, love, etc., uh, law and love, etc. What is the film about? I will show you about 10 minutes of uh, excerpts from this film, but I, let me introduce you a little bit about the topic and with all the spo spoilers. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It is, um, the film starts in 1958. It's Christmas and it's Hungary. The main character is called Eva Salansky and it's played by Polish um, Polish uh, uh, actor, Jadwiga actress, Jadwiga Jankowska Cieślak. Eva, at the very beginning of the film, which is unlike the book, is killed. And she is killed by trying to cross the border. The, guard, the border guard warns her, but she fails to stop and she is killed. At the same time, in the, in the same time, um, in hospital, a hospital, Livia Horvat, played by, by Grażyna Szapołowska, with the bandage around her neck, is recuperating from the recent jealousy attack of her husband, who tried to kill her. Because she admitted that she doesn't love him anymore and that she loved Eva. In the retrospection, so all the film happens in the retrospection. And in the retrospection, we actually learn about the love affair. And it's a really, really beautiful love affair. They meet in their, uh, in their jobs, in their work as the journalist in the weekly periodical, which ironically, unfortunately, is called Truth. And um, the love attraction between, the, or the attraction between, the, uh, between those women is instantaneous, absolutely immediate, but, uh, but the love develop uh, slowly because Livia, which is heterosexual, is uh, tr trying to resist the, uh, the attempts uh, of uh, seducing her by, by Eva. Um, there is, but uh, they, uh, they uh, fall in love. Uh, there is a ver first, probably in the mainstream uh, cinema, very uh, um, uh, vivid uh, love scenes uh, in, uh, and uh, very beautifully, be beautifully done, uh, with, uh, accompanied with the music by, uh, by, uh, made by two composers, very fam famous jazz uh, player and composer, Laszlo Desch and Janusz Masik. Well, there is so the love, this is one, uh, the love part, but there is another part of the film which, is, which I probably am more interested in, and I will tell you more about it because it overshadows the lesbian uh, visibility uh, uh, framework of this film. So there is a political thread of the plot. Eva is working for the, for the journal and she's working on the piece on farm cooperative and she's trying to show how how the character of this cooperative is cooperative. I'm sorry, is uh, developing, and how the uh, the ideals of communism, ideals of collect of collective farm, ideals of 1956 revolution, is corrupted. She finds that the authorities have blocked the more democratic way of organizing the cooperative project. She exposes the nepotism, corruption of the venture, her 
previously supportive ad editor is shocked. She, he said, we cannot say it. We cannot keep telling about, uh, about 1956 as a revolution. We have to be much more milder, milder because there are limits of the truth. And this is how, uh, you know, how ironic it is that the, the truth is limiting the, the, uh, limiting the truth itself. And at the same time, the uh, previously kind of understanding the uh, husband of Livia, Don Chi Horvat, and, and army officers, and this is very important because it's the he, this is the figure of a law, of superego, of uh, control, the husband saying no to these rumors of lesbian affair. And when Eva says, well, no, I'm, I'm uh, suppressing, uh, I'm not suppressing my feelings, I love her, she is shot, but uh, she survives. But the love is, um, is not, it, it, the love affair cannot be happy, uh, they have no happy ends, because at the same time, um, Livia is rejected Eva after this tragic situation, and Eva is in fact committing suicide by trying to uh, cross this uh, border that is, uh, that is obviously impossible to cross. The state border, but un the state border is a metaphor of sexuality and uh, normative border. Well, uh, this is basically the framing of the film. I, um, I would like to show you just a couple of uh, a couple of minutes of this film, so so you see what is the what's the mood of the film. It's uh, how how it looks. Uh, what's the music? I, I show you like uh, three minutes of the beginning, and then the first m meetings in the in uh, in the uh, in the film. The film's kind of lesbian closeness. Can you hear it? Not really. Solansky, Evo. Uh, um, the 
doesn't seem to be have the about the aesthetics of this uh, of this film and maybe maybe we can ask someone to uh, to come and help us with the subtitles and then we can do it at the at the end but i i will carry on but it's you can kind of feel that it is a little bit a gloomy kind of we 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 laugh in poland there is uh, there is typical eastern european film very kind of the, with the music it's obviously going to be tragic but uh, um, uh, mm, that it that is kind of pessimistic but very poetic but at the same time we have straight away this tragic situation of a woman in the hospital so we know that whatever will happen it's kind of um, it's n it's rather gonna be a tragic story is that that a, uh, a happy ending because that is actually we will see straight away that it is a retrospection and that is very se very serious. The other uh, uh, part which I wanted to show you is when they meet, and it's very famous, and it's probably the only uh, scene that you can see easily on the on YouTube. The scene when they are, they are the first meeting, the first clo lesbian closeness of these two women in the dark at night in the um, in the park. And there's kissing and the police, another, a super ego, a law, uh, comes up and say, what are you doing? And uh, they say, first they say to Livia, we will tell your husband if you, we see you again in this uncompromised position. So they ex this, this gesture of, of treating women, adult women, as a child, and, on the uh, on, and to Eva, they say, and you coming with us with a uh, uh, kind of uh, hint that that is not the first time. And they take her, but they don't arrest her. It's kind of ritual thinking, okay, we will tell you where is your situation. They, they separated, they scared, and obviously they promised that they're never gonna do again, at least uh, leave ya. And uh, the funny thing is that the, in this uh, uh, second excerpt, which I wanted to show, uh, is that, um, they say, what do you think? It is America here? Like meaning that these kind of things are not happening in Eastern Europe. These uh, kind of things are not, not happening here. Maybe there. So again, this notion of borders here, us and them, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, reintroduced. Uh, so it, as you can see, it's very clever, very cleverly done. It's beautiful stories. And it, it, the only, there is this intertwinement connection with politics. But you would say, think it is a story of, it is a lesbian story. It is a m first mainstream thing, uh, uh, film made by Caroline Mag, which is a very big, um, 
name, very, very respectful director in Hungary at that time, comparable to Polish uh, Andrzej Wajda. So, uh, so you would think he actually wanted to show something that is, uh, that is tabooed, something that, that, that is completely invisible, that his politics is very uh, progressive. But my question is, really? Uh, and I wanted to uh, share with you my suspicions that it's not really the fact that what he was really doing is probably even worse than actually not talking about lesbian as uh, at all. Well, definitely the film of Caroline Mack was meant it was. Uh, uh, was uh, meant to be a um, groundbreaking film for one reason. The fact that this, this uh, revolution, this 1956 revolution, which was under complete spell of, um, of uh, uh, not talking about it, it was meant to be counter-revolution, something bad. But this film, as the first cinematic, cinematic phenomenon, talks about 1956 as revolution, but all the time this word revolution is used by lesbian, by, by Eva. So again, uh, why? why? Why it was allowed by, for example, censorship to do that? Well, a few facts before I go this and talk, talk about, you know, when the, uh, uh, talk a little bit about this lesbian visibility slash politics, what actually Caroline Mack wanted to do. Few um, Polish contexts, few Polish facts. Why, why, did was, uh, why uh, there was uh, the main actress, of, uh, uh, those two, are played by the Polish actress. This is Jadwiga Jankow jankowska Cieślak, who um, actually in 90, uh, in um, 1982 won the, uh, in the Cannes Festival the Palme d'Or, and that is Grażyna Szapołowska, at that time very, and generally in Poland, very, very popular uh, actress. There are two reasons that why Karoli Mack chosen those two, act, uh, those two actors, and these are th those reasons, not one reason is important, one reason is an urban myth. The urban myth goes that non-Hungarian uh, actors wanted to be, to play the role. It is absolutely not true, but you can even find it on internet that this kind of myth repeated by, by, uh, 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 by people. It is not true, it is kind of, uh, uh, as I said, urban myth. The reason is that Caroline Mack wanted, and he hinted it, wanted to express his solidarity with Polish actress, uh, 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 Polish actors that at that time boycotted the mainstream cinema in Poland because there was a big, uh, a, a very t tough time of the martial law. So, and especially within this martial law time, at the end of the 1982, when the film was. Uh, uh, short, and 1983 was particularly harsh for Polish, uh, Polish actors, or Polish actors' um, uh, milieu. So my idea and my hypothesis and my thesis, which I think is right, is that he wanted to express his solidarity with movement, with solidarity movement, and with actors, and that it also goes with the politics of the film. How lesbian? Uh, so what? Let's uh, let's talk about how, what is what, what is it about? Uh, oh, it's here about lesbian. Why Caroline Mark, a very uh, uh, renowned, very famous uh, director, who has no idea about any kind of? Uh, 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 he's not interested in really hetero. Uh, 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 homosexual uh, history, why he's taking up this theme, and what does lesbian mean in this film? Well, I think that lesbians are, and here is the title of all the whole our lectures, is um, here uh, just a cover-up or dog weasel politics. Is it the right? Yes. Um, so, 
definitely I wanted to stress that I know that this film is a cult for lesbian audience of Cold War uh, time or Cold War Hungary, but also in Poland. It was um, shown in the May the theater, as I said. It was broadly known about, which is very unlikely even for today, lesbian films. Actually, last year we have the first lesbian film, mainstream Polish film, uh, in, the, in the main uh, the, uh, cinemas uh, shown. And that is absolutely without, uh, without uh, questions. But what I wanted to show, what I wanted to argue is actually the opposite, that it is, uh, this film is to present not the unseen silences, uh, absence of, uh, of visibility, of lesbian visibility, but actually to make, have the strategy to talk about forbidden, forbidden politics, to talk about 1956 revolution in the time of, in this kind of turmoil time of Eastern Europe, of beginning of the 1980s, when there is martial law, when probably there is still fear of, uh, of uh, uh, Soviet Union invasion on Poland. So the, in this time, Karolin Mark very bravely tried to talk about the first anti-communist or kind of revisionary movement in Eastern Poland, in Eastern Bloc, in Eastern, Eastern Europe. And how does he do it? He is just taking up the strongest taboo ever, the lesbian taboos. He's taking up something that obviously everybody will look into rather than trying to find out what what politics is used with this, uh, with this uh, dog weasel uh, strategies. So how, um, so he's, uh, he's taking up the lesbians just as a cover up and here, is, he, 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 here, here are the two argument why I think this is right. The first is that this lesbian and the Eva is the, the only lesbian there, is the extreme character, uncompromising, stubborn, a little bit, you know, heavy smoker, but who isn't in this film? And uh, like trying to be all the time like a man. And, uh, and, and she's only the one, uh, she's only one who, uh, the, the main director, the editor of the newspaper, newspaper allow her to, to talk about 1956 as the revolution, not counter-revolution. And it is almost impossible, taking, uh, taking into account the very severe censorship at that time, that, is, that it was actually allowed. And I think the Caroline Mark knew that it, will, it is allowed if everybody will look at this film through the sexuality theme, rather the theme of what they talk about. And then, so, uh, so that is the, this kind of usage of revolution as it, through this dramatic, drastic, extreme figure of lesbian protagonist is one thing that, that shows me that, okay, they, she, he wanted to talk about 1956. He wanted also, by, by employing Polish actress, he wanted to talk about solidarity of Polish context. The sec second evidence is subtler, and it took me several months to, to actually find out what is going on. Because at this scene of cooper cooperative, cooperative, when Eva is kind of looking what's going on in this farm, they sing some songs. And I knew that it has to be something serious about these songs, because, you know, there are a bunch of uh, drunk, uh, dr uh, drunkards singing songs. And, you know, like, how come the long part of the film can be devoted to these dubious scenes? But then I found out that they uh, sing not just a drinking, uh, let's get together songs, but they, they actually sing a secular anthem. And the secular are the minor Hungarian minority in Transylvania. Uh, and it's very politically com complicated topic because it, uh, those, those are the Hungarian after First World War who left, who stayed in Transylvania, and Transylvania was very serious, very 
nostalgic and important for Hungarian identity land, which was given to Romania instead of uh, uh, being left in Hung Hungary. And Hungary is obviously, after First World War, a very disappointed state, the state that is left small and with a lot of minority left behind. So this this uh, secular anthem uh, sung by the drunkard uh, uh, is another thing, uh, another argument telling me uh, uh, Caroline Mack talks politics. Caroline Mack talks a serious, forbidden then, of, of even banned politics, like dealing with minorities and dealing with, uh, with 1956. Uh, revolution. And when we think about this, this unlikely, uh, unlikeness of lesbian theme in Caroline Marx's career ceases to be such a mystery and appears simply as a cinematic strategy to use women homosexuality, women's homosexuality as a cover-up story. So lesbian there is just the lesbians there are used are actually invisible, and that is super interesting because when we look straight, very closely, this increase of visibility is actually double coverage, it's covering again, and uh, rather than um, uh, emancipating or discovering. And obviously, we can, we can go into, and I, I was doing it in my research, we can actually see what would be the lesbian sign in cinema or in any cultural, uh, any semiotic activity. And it, I, I, we can use, for example, a very old Teresa de Loretti's uh, uh, mm, definition that, that lesbian always obliterates the boundaries of gender identity, not by denying it, or denying and, or, or either gender or sex, but by transcending them. And this cannot, nothing like this, nothing so, so uh, clearly can be found as in the, in the Carolis Mark film. The lesbian in 1982 film, the 1982 production is a completely failed project. Lesbian protagonist, be, dis, despite the fact that it looks to be authentic and have authentic roots, because you remember this film was based on this Gargoche novel. And uh, Elizabeth Gargoche was, uh, uh, was the writer, the, at that time the head of the writer union in Hungary, and she was closeted to the end, closeted to the lesbian. So she's actually writing about her. And uh, so, it is, so this authentic roots seems, uh, should give this film some sort of an authenticity. And it does, but to what extent, but it, it does in some, Okay, is in some uh, meaning. I will I will go back to that in a second. But when we think about this film as the public communication, as a public information, it meant to be about politics. It meant and lesbians were supposed to be only used as the as the uh, dog whistle uh, politics. Well, the. Um, the film critics Mima Simic and Kevin Moss in 2010 articles post communist Lavender Menace, Lesbians in Mainstream East European Film, and this is the f only uh, serious article about this film, analyzed the figure of lesbian in various East, East European films, uh, starting from, uh, from uh, uh, another way, and they they use this idea of a metaphor of broadly speaking national construction. They say, they claim that lesbian films often have very little to tell about the lesbian lives. And this is the most interesting taboo when thinking about lesbian visibility of lesbians in film. It's not that lesbianism is a subject of taboo, is that there are often, um, it is often unspoken or overseen the fact that lesbians are just used as the vehicle for another kind of communication, another kind of information. 
they are used um, as the cultural discourses in the cultural discourses of to dealing with other other fears in society just like in the pornography they are used for the sexual heterosexual pleasure in culture they are often used to challenge other aspects rather than primacy of heterosexual or male homosexual desires and the whole films is actually confirm this kind of uh, this kind of uh, this uh, uh, threat the Let's talk a little bit about, for example, borders. There were, from the very beginning, and in the, in the, in the book, the, the, death, the death is happening at the end, so we don't have it as strongly, but, um, but in here we have this, um, this uh, retrospection. So we st from the very beginning, no, we have the information. There are limits of his freedom. There are limits of what you can do. And, uh, and then uh, this, uh, these limi limi limits are, uh, are here all seen through these uh, the, uh, borders. There are borders of, uh, that, uh, that the husband of Livia tells, you can't do that. There are physical borders, the borders of the, of the states, and, this, and, the, uh, and the crossing the borders are always, uh, have all, always tragic consequences. Um, so there, the, ev any crossing of the borders have political, conse uh, political, political consequences. And Eva, if she transpasses the, pro the borders, she always be uh, st stays, uh, becomes a victim. We know that she is a victim of 1956 and that she didn't work see till the, the start of the novel, till 1985. Uh, even though she's a very talented, a very well-known uh, journalist. Um, she, uh, she, is, um, she, will be, uh, she will be punished by, by her relationship with, uh, with uh, Livia. She will be finally killed by trying to uh, trespass the political borders. She's also trespassing the borders of language by using this politically incorrect language, using the 1956 rev counter-revolution as a revolution. And all these bold tra trespassing borders are kind of overseen in the film. Today, it's completely invisible by the, by the, by the audience. B and this, this kind of invisibility is seen because she's, she's lesbian. And as a lesbian, and this Caroline Mack knew it straight away, she is a little bit unreliable protagonist. She's excessive. She's doomed to failure. And she has to be mistrusted. Just her, as her sexual practices can only be interpreted as excessive to heteronormative culture. And her main editor tells her this very, stro very, very strongly when she, uh, when she said, there is always a limit to what you can, uh, can uh, publish. There is always a limit to the truth. So those borders as metaphorical, um, metaphorical uh, limits of hetero, uh, heteronormative society is all the time seen here, he, seen here and because, and they, they are so vivid because, in fact, Eva is not a lesbian. And Karen Mark is, didn't want to show lesbian. Eva is just political dissident. And just as a political dissident, she is a little bit mistrusted because whatever, whatever is it, whether is it a good, uh, on a good purpose or not, Political dis uh, to be political dis uh, dissident is always a very dubious, a very progressive, transgressive, transgressive uh, element. So, Carrie Mark in 1982 used transgressive character to talk about transgressive politics, about dissidents of communist time. I think it's absolutely, do uh, absolutely gen genius. But, uh, but it's not that it's completely inauthentic, this film. Obviously, it is, there is an authenticity. First of all, the authenticity of, the, of this film comes, uh, comes up when we talk about the book. When we go back 
to this 1980 book uh, uh, by Gal Gorci. She r talks about her experience. She wanted to talk about her identity, private identity, by using the national mm -hmm. distance. So actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. So there is, an, there is a possibility of the opposite to my interpretation of this thing. She used national, national discourse as the uh, uh, smoke screen in order to talk about herself. element of the authors brings up this authentic element of lesbian visibility and as such can be rescue for non-heteronormative lesbian history. But, uh, but it doesn't mean that I'm not, I, I'm not right, that I'm wrong. It just means that it has to be connected, that it has to be um, shown in various contexts. And it, it, show, it also shows that there is an authenticity in this kind of lesbian coming, uh, coming up that don't rather have private impact, the impact of one woman, rather than in, in, and not the visibility of community, visibility of lesbian life, because in, as such, they are tragic, they, they, they have to fail, as Caroline Mack shows. Okay, I'll go to conclusions, before, and then hopefully we'll, we'll manage to conquer the uh, DVD. Well, there is no doubt that lesbians in Caroline Mack's film is a metaphor of national and political discourse. And she is a threat to it. She needs to be symbolically killed. And the, you know, this uh, killing is not only killing by the guards of the borders, but there is also killing by the husband of wife. If you cross something, you know, the law tells you what can be done within the law, as the, the, the original title, title of the film tells her. She is then a double metaphor as a sexual and political dissident but the sexual ha has to be uh, a failure. In both cases, in fact, she's a tragic figure. But, um, and when we uh, wanted to talk rather about hip lesbian visibility and lesbian issue of what, what, le what, what lesson can it be from this film, we can see that this representation of lesbians or monsters, the representation of fears, of the other in society, as Jeffrey Cohen notes that one can understand a culture by the monsters in engenders. So however monstrous, however monstrous lesbians are seen in the culture, then you see how tolerant the culture is. Should we, that, so what, what can we do? Can we talk about lesbian only in transnational, as transnational pro projects, because these national notions are always sucky, you know, taking, overtaking the lesbians as the symbols of something else? Should we always try to see lesbians on the, in the broader perspective as trans transnational, beyond cultures? Should we reinterpret the uh, Virgi famous Virginia Woolf quotation that as a woman I have no country. So maybe as a lesbian, I don't even, even, if we go even further, I don't even want to talk about whether I have or not the country and I'm not interested. Well, however much I am tempted by this kind of perspective, transnational perspective, I know that it is the end route and we actually will be talking about this on Friday transnational neglects, it, neglects national, and it's probably the, 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 the reason why we are in various backlashes in various parts of Europe and, world, and the world. 
We also know that this pan-national perspective is too utopian and historically false when we take into consideration how many lesbians were active in creating national discourses. We will talk, uh, Anna will talk in a minute about Maria Konopnicka in Poland. We can mention Cecilia Torme in Hungary. And here, obviously, when you think about the uh, uh, late 19th century, the beginning 20th century, um, activists, suffrage, suffrage, suffragists, uh, um, I was th trying to find, uh, find out and read about uh, and connect it to the Valbori Ulander. But obviously, they are also part of the national discourse and they wanted to be part of national discourse. Nothing to do with transnational national history. So we have to make our own story. We, it has to be national. So the last sentence is that, what was my last sentence? I think it's, no, it's, no, I have it somewhere. Well, that was my last sentence. Deconstructing lesbian figure as a metaphor in nationali nationalistic political discourse to say that lesbians are used in national political discourse is not to say that national political discourse is not important for lesbians. Obviously it is. But to deconstruct, to criticize Carole Mack on other, in other words, is to say that we have to see the way how they are uh, used. What are the strategy of using to clearly know what is our position and what other people try to posit us within. And only as such we can see that the idea of writing a, to, or the idea of seeing lesbian as an actual community if, if in their needs, in the needs of construction is actually vivid. And that is the, uh, uh, the, the my, my, um, my, uh, my conclusions. Um, and I will, uh, and this um, lecture will be followed by, by Anna who, uh, my colleague who will go um, no, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, who will follow and who will do a little bit talk about this, this uh, uh, gesture of reclaiming, the, uh, the, the gesture of how national discourse was, um, was uh, d dominating uh, lesbian, uh, lesbian discourse. But before that, we might have like 10 minutes. Uh, can, do we have time or was, yeah, we don't really. Yeah, uh, so I want, because what I wanted to show you, as you have the beginning, and I wanted to show you the five minutes of this pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, scene. And the thing is that uh, perhaps it's better to not to deal, they, they talk very little in this deal because it's kind of uh, erotic, kind of nice, uh, romantic scene. And uh, when, they, uh, when, they, when the police uh, uh, or militia comes, you know that they ask about documents, that you know that they tell her, tell her uh, you know, go because we tell you daddy, oh no, the husband. Okay, so uh, perhaps it's not even necessary to, to understand. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I think it's good. Ah, well, wounded. Tell me by.
Very interesting because they, uh, in the other part, you will see that they all, even though they are hidden, they all can see because there is a mirror at the back of the of the room. So it's kind of a, a public gaze is like not direct gaze, but kind of looking into and and uh, and the one of the waitress is also lesbian. So. Um, and there will be a connection, and she will be the rejected one later on. And that this is the the most famous the, uh, uh, scene of the and, and used in all posters and. Render she. <laughs> happens. Like, uh, Caroline Mack is an amazing director. You can see this way of um, uh, sensitivity. He can see, you know, what kind of the, the level of shame, of awkwardness of the situation, how, how they don't, and they also fear. You know, we're talking about, we, you know, probably we cannot understand anymore the fear of a, a pol police officers in the middle of the night. They can do anything. So she's sent to husband, and uh, she. Yeah, you can't do it here. Do it. Why you can't do it to me? Are we? It's not America. Okay, that is all I wanted to. Uh, uh, it's from me. Now, thank you so much, Anna. Okay, so uh, am I not too loud? Probably a little bit.
you can see I um, actually I'm going to start uh, where uh, Ula stopped um, when she when she referred to uh, uh, Cohen and uh, his monsters uh, so uh, obviously not his monsters but monsters monsters as the representation of the other in uh, 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 society so as you can see here I will try to give it a little bit broader uh, uh, context for I have this thought that maybe the whole thing um, mm, uh, all I was talking about, has been talking about, is somehow deeply, deeply rooted uh, in, uh, mm, well, the context of this civilization, whatever we, uh, uh, we call it. So I would like to start from referring to, uh, to Kocharya, who would say that the wild man had to be invented before he even was discovered, which is actually very true uh, when we uh, look at uh, the, you know, various uh, cultural uh, and historical context of the usage of the mythological wild men and wild women, not only back in the ancient times, uh, but also uh, in the Middle Ages, through Pliny, somewhere in between. Uh, so uh, this is somehow, you know, this is very intriguing, the, this idea of wild man, uh, wild woman, like, you know, an Amazon center, or many, many uh, uh, other, who are just, you know, the representation, the expression of um, uh, something what we generally fear, like, you know, uh, ferocity, evil, you know, deeply submerged in uh, nature, and that is why wild. And on the other hand, <clears throat> of nobility and of purity, which, of course, as uh, uh, Hayden White, for example, would say, this, this makes, uh, you know, a myth with twin poles, yes, which is, uh, I think, a very, uh, a, a very uh, suitable and useful metaphor within um, uh, the context uh, here. So, Jesus, what should I press? Uh, I. Uh, I. Uh, this one, thank you. Okay, so, uh, well, a t typical representation of uh, uh, Amazons uh, taken from uh, a Greek. Vaza, for we know that uh, actually uh, Vazas were the you know the, the main uh, um, medium through which uh, um, the, the Greeks uh, uh, actually uh, informed the others about uh, the mythological and themselves about mythological stories. Uh, so. Um, this is also very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, interesting. What the Amazons were actually used for yes, within the Greek society, within, uh, within the uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, context. So, um, of course, you know, there is a number of possible interpretations that I'm, you know, not uh, pretending that I am giving the right one or the only one. But uh, uh, I think that they can also be looked at as, uh, you know, so kind of military monsters. This is uh, what we see uh, from the first glance. Yes, we, we think about Amazons as military uh, uh, monsters, and uh, uh, 
I think these three are quite essential here. Uh, of course, certainly there are the others on the battlefield within the context of, of war, battle, uh, military conflict, uh, fight, and so on and so on. Then uh, the, the next thing is the transgression of sexual roles, which is uh, quite obvious uh, here. But I think that the most important thing here is the, you know, the destruction, the fear of the destruction of the social order. This is uh, uh, actually what um, uh, the Amazons are used for within uh, uh, Greek uh, mythology because they are, okay, who are Amazons? Amazons are women inviting public sphere. Yes? And that is why it's so dangerous. This public sphere is traditionally all male this, or only uh, male, so everything is actually, whatever we think about, you know, within the framework of public sphere, is, uh, is all male and only male. So um, this is a, you know, a ridiculous figure, a, a woman who is actually fighting and she is good at it and she's dangerous. Uh, so she's a, uh, uh, she's a threat. That is, by the way, why Amazons uh, within the mythological stories were unlike other wild men and women um, placed somewhere uh, far away from the Greek borders. Yes, because usually the wild men and wild women of the Greek mythology uh, were you know, inhabiting some nearby places like mountains, forests, lakes, uh, islands, and so on and so on. Now, uh, uh, Amazons were uh, one of the very few exceptions. Yes? They, they live somewhere there, somewhere among Scythians, for example, yes? or Ethiopians, very far away from here. That much we don't want this happen in Greece. Uh, so uh, this was kind of very strong uh, 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 statement. Uh, 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 sorry for this, but I like my drawing so much that uh, <laughs> I decided to <laughs> uh, make it a part of the presentation, which is, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's nice to see something different from time to time. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, uh, Labris, very intriguing thing with, within this uh, 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 story. They, you know, usually they are pictured on vases, for example. They are pictured brandishing Labris, which is, you know, double X. Uh, and uh, throughout the history, gradually, but the, as you can see here, the history of Labris is very, very long. It goes back to the Bronze Age, actually. So it became gradually the symbol of uh, uh, duality and uh, uh, transgression. So, you know, I know that this is a, a simplification, right? But um, uh, I, I think that generally we can say that when, when we think about Labris and when we think about its duality and the myth with twin poles, we, we think about this opposition, yes? Female, male, nature, uh, culture, which is obvious in case of, of any wild figure in Greek mythology. And then, of course, chaos and order. This chaos and order is definitely social, so it has a social context, uh, and originally probably also military and uh, uh, political. And if we look even, you know, deeper and go back to, I don't know, 2000. BC, uh, Crete, Minoan, uh, religion, linear uh, B uh, tablets, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, uh, then we see that uh, Labris was not, Labris or Peleucus was not only the, 
a weapon which was occasionally used in Greece. Actually, more often it was used by Persians. Uh, but it was also the represented uh, um, on, on, uh, within this uh, Minoan religion as the symbol of Arche, probably one of the oldest symbols of, of uh, Arche, right? The Greek Arche. Uh, sometimes even Zeus was uh, painted, presented with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 Labris. Um, on the other hand, of course, we have, you know, modern usage of Labris. Um, and the, the, the first possible connection is, of course, uh, uh, feminism. Back in the 60s, it you know, became the symbol of uh, uh, um, matriarchal society, matriarchy, and so on and so on. Then, of course, lesbianism and the 70s, and probably it is you know, the, the best known modern usage of, uh, 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 of Labris. But, it, is also, it was also used by Italian neo-fascists, for example, back in, the, uh, uh, back in the 60s. So, you know, this gives us really um, mm, interesting and uh, 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 dangerous uh, uh, melange of, uh, you know, uh, modern m m uh, movements like uh, feminism or lesbianism and then uh, neo-fascism, and all, all of it in, in the context of, uh, uh, of the, uh, you know, Minoan um, um, civilization. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I refer to this, I use this Labris uh, uh, story, uh, because I, I think that, you know, the, our memory, our cultural memory within the framework of, uh, of, of civilization uh, can be tracked basically back to the, uh, to the ancient times. And uh, uh, when we think about wild men and wild women and, you know, various monsters of Middle Ages, uh, witches, um, uh, the Pliny races, uh, they all represent, you know, the threat. They are all some kind of, you know, ref reference to our social fear. And we have been doing this, we have been thinking this as a society or societies for such a long time. Yes? And our modern history is just, you know, like this. Right? So no wonder we are still using this, uh, this image of monster and of course we are um, working on it. Yes? Uh, maybe changing a little bit, but uh, oh, sorry for the quality, it doesn't look uh, good on the, uh, uh, on the screen. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Going back to modernity. Uh, uh, I would like also to, you know, sh show you a, a few examples of uh, how actually, you know, the national discourse, the national narrative can cover up the, uh, uh, the, the lesbian story, the lesbianism, or however we, uh, we, we call it. Of course, there is a number of uh, uh, great uh, possible examples, uh, like this one, uh, Maria Konopnicka. Uh, actually, it, it all, you know, the uncovering of uh, homobiographies in Poland started not very long ago, only, in, you know, uh, this book was, uh, uh, was published in 2007, and basically, yes, we can say this, that everybody, or almost everybody, or people who were actually interested in it were somehow referring to the rumors, you know, moral chaos in life of this and that uh, writer or poet or politician, but actually nothing more than that. 
so, uh, uh, so Tomasik was, uh, you know, definitely um, uh, changing the, uh, uh, the narrative, which was, of course, never accepted by uh, the speakers of, you know, hard nationalism in Poland, for example. Why? Uh, so Maria Konopnicka, I, I just uh, f first I want to, to show you the uh, the slides because you know they kind of speak for themselves. Yes. Uh, so this was Maria Konopnicka, a renowned Polish uh, uh, writer, very much like uh, actually I I could call her um, the Polish you know Zelma Lagerlof, but uh, much less talented which doesn't mean that she wasn't as popular as Zelma Lagerlof at, at, at more or less the same, uh, the same time. She was, uh, she was born in the uh, 1840s, so it's basically you know, the, same, uh, uh, the same generation, the, 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 the same type of uh, writing. But today we know she had no talent, or almost no talent. I'm not a literary critic, so... Uh, I could say that, you know, all I could say is that I really liked her book, uh, books for kids. They're great. As a kid, I, uh, uh, I loved them. Anyhow, a uh, few more slides. So this is her, you know, supposedly partner, painter, Maria Dulembianka. Uh, and then this way, okay, I like this. <laughs> Actually, I, I've just realized that these are both 20s, yes? So this is how much we actually, you know, price the... <laughs> <I'd> <laughs> um, but that's true, you know, this, this is a coin which was uh, actually released back in uh, 80s, yes, back in the socialist times. Uh, this one is not in the circulation, as far as I know, any, uh, uh, anymore. So, uh, uh, yes, this is, you know, the, the, this is the, the, the Polish Maria Konopnicka, and this is this, the Swedish uh, 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 Zerma uh, uh, Lagerlof. So, uh, the thing with Konopnicka uh, is that um, uh, she... Uh, uh, she was really popular, and she's still very popular in this uh, nationalist circles, very far-right nationalist circles, uh, for she is mostly known in Poland as the author of uh, Rota, the Oath, which uh, for many years was a kind of an, an official Polish anathem, very, uh, you know, patriotic, not even patriotic, maybe nationalistic, very anti-German, basically anti-German, yes? So it's, you know, it starts like no German will spit in our face. It's, you know, a very strong statement and, uh, okay, it, it, it had a chance to be reasonable, um, you know, at the end of the 19th century, uh, but it makes no sense actually right now Though it's very often, you know, sung aloud by these nationalists and during their demonstrations. So, uh, yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, anyhow, <clears throat> uh, we already know that Konopnicka had a partner. Uh, actually, of course, some people say that we cannot say it for 100%. I love the Polish Wikipedia, uh, which states that um, they lived in possibly romantic relationship. I know, the, I like this expression, possibly romantic relationship. And something have been speculated also, but this is not certain. Now, so you could, you know, look at the pictures again and then think about, you know, whether this, uh, this Wikipedia statement is reasonable or not, I think it's totally unreasonable. But um, anyhow, her partner, uh, um, 
Maria Dulembianka was a very talented painter, and uh, he was also, you know, a, um, a passionate, very passionate and very influential um, uh, emancipation activist. Uh, and uh, Konopnicka would spend something like 20, uh, uh, 20 years with, uh, with her. If this, if this was, um, you know, a romantic whatever, uh, anyhow, it was a very close relationship, right? For example, Konopnicka would call her Peter, right? Uh, which may seem insignificant, but, uh, you know, makes you think. Uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm just telling this, you know, I'm making fun of it. This is, this is kind of ridiculous, yes? The, 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 thing is, uh, the thing is quite evident, but the, the, what is my point here is that uh, actually n nobody besides, you know, a number of uh, writers like Tomasik or LGBT activists or gender, uh, studies, uh, uh, researchers uh, would still believe the story of her lesbianism, right? Uh, so uh, another thing is that she really uh, cover up the story herself. So she, she didn't want to uh, actually, you know, take up this uh, uh, narrative, which was, um, which was quite... Um, uh, obvious at that time, uh, but anyhow, uh, you know, the story goes on actually because there is a uh, there is a number of you know eminent Polish writers like uh, like this one uh, Maria uh, uh, Dombrowska back in the thirties uh, she uh, wrote uh, oh, she was much more talented than the latter one yes. Uh, so she, she wrote really, really nice uh, uh, saga of, uh, uh, you know, Polish impoverished gentry back in the 19th century to the modern times. Nice, very well written, intriguing, fascinating, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so this is her partner. She, she spent, again, 20 years of her life. Um, uh, with her, this relationship was very complicated, maybe even weird, uh, but anyhow, which kind of relationship is not weird? Uh, so, um, anyhow, kind of, you know, tragic, dramatic, with this uh, daughter of, the, um, of her partner, Anna Kowalska, also writer, uh, somewhere in the middle between them, the one was not accepted by, uh, uh, by uh, Dombrowska. She was, you know, instantly jealous um, of uh, 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 Kowalska daughter. This is the uh, cover of uh, journals by, by uh, Anna Kowalska, published only recently. So I, I think, you know, the, the picture is uh, kind of obvious. We also, you know, there is a there is a reasonable testimony which is in the journals both of both writers, yes, and it, it leaves you actually no illusions about the nature of the relationship. But again, Dombrowska would not refer to her relationship with Kowalska in any other way than, you know, very individual, very private, no broader context, no reference to any kind of, you know, homosexuality or whatever, right? Not mentioning um, uh, you know, any, you know, human rights, gay rights, nothing like this. This is out of the question. So, you know, if the writers themselves would like to use this strategy and cover Right, up the stories with this, uh, I don't know, patriotic national discourse uh, uh, and so on. So um, uh, <clears throat> why, you know, the, the public opinion should do something else, actually, with their heritage, right? 
So the, the, the thing is that uh, we, we are, we've been discussing with Ula the, the question of visibility. Yes? And uh, our conclusion is that actually <sighs> the lesbians are not visible <laughs> because they, you know, their story is all, always covered with something else, right? So when you think about modern politics in Poland right now, yes, we have this very popular right now politician who is, you know, the first openly gay politician and he's, you know, he started, the, uh, he launched a, a new party just a, a few weeks ago. The party is called Spring, and now he's, you know, promising the, the change, the social change, the, uh, the cultural uh, uh, change, and so on and so on. So when he is mentioned in press, no matter whether it is a Polish press or a, or a foreign press, then the first sentence is always the first Polish openly gay politician. Now, when uh, lesbians are, you know, become a part of politics, like for example, Maria Lempart, who was uh, one of the leaders of black protests in Poland, right? So she was on also an openly lesbian politician, right? But um, she just made her coming out, and that's the end of the story, because she's just a feminist, right? She's just an activist. She's just a part of the black protests, and so on, and so on, and so on. So nobody actually is, you know, still mentioning the fact that she's a lesbian. She's just one of those feminists, right? While he is an openly, you know, gay politician. Right? That, that is the difference. So it, the, 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 our conclusion is that it, it's, it's always, you know, covered up by something else, by some kind of dominant mainstream, a little bit more important discourse, even if it is a feminist discourse, for example. So still much more important. Right? Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna, uh, and thank you, Ula. That was most rewarding, very interesting. Um, I have a question to you, to both of you. Um, do you think that um, um, another day would have passed the censorship in Hungary, or Poland for that, for that matter, in 1982, with two men in, in the lead roles? Well, yeah, would it, would it pass the censorship? Would it, would it be possible to, to make the film? In, you know, an equivalent situation, a love story. That's it's hypothetical. It, it,
Thank you. There are, uh, there are dissidents. Very interesting. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, any questions, Paul? Okay, we, we are running out of time. Thanks a lot once more, Ula um, Narsala, Ursula. Uh, you're all welcome to Media Huset um, tomorrow at 9.30. Uh, we will go more into detail about the current day-to-day -day situation you, in you. Poland. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you.